thumb on view. I hope people can hear me. Can I maybe get some feedback? Yes, perfect. Uh, since the feedback is coming through the chat box, that would be great because if I open the participants uh, box more, then I cannot see, or you guys cannot see part of my slides. Um, I must apologize right from the start. Um, I got myself into a foot injury yesterday, so I'm, I have to lie down because I have a torn ligament. And uh, I'm trying to to do this webinar nevertheless anyway. Um, so if I, I'm a little bit shorter in the webinar today, then you know the reason for this. All right. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, do let me know via the chat box um, in between. Um, and I'll give you a quick overview now of uh, Oh, thank you very much. That's that's very kind. Uh, so if you have any any questions, please uh, into the chat box or send me an email. Anything uh, you want to know. All right. So as I said, we do have an introductory webinar today about ethical decision making. Um, a quick. I just put this up here now. Um, some some info about myself. I thought we could start it with like this so that you actually know who you're dealing with. Um, so this is uh, me here and um, my background is that I was born in Austria. I'm now back in Austria. I've lived in Singapore for about uh, 10 years um, and traveled back and forth between Singapore and London for four years. I've been with Global Next and its predecessor U21 since uh, 2003 and was actually the very first person to ever teach uh, a course at Global Next U21 Global. I do have three children and I'm very much into women leadership programs because I think it is really, really important um, to not be against men, not to have this misunderstood. This is nothing against men, but it is foster um, women's careers and just to make sure that uh, we do have some better environment uh, for women as well. Now, what did I do? I went from something very traditional from a university that is um, more than 400 years old with a master's degree in economics and a PhD in social and economic sciences and then another master's degree in healthcare management um, when I was the deputy head of department at the Department of International Management at the University of Graz. Um, as I said, a very traditional university, six Nobel Prize winners, everything. Grew up in such a family with university professors, my parents both university professors, but then they almost had a heart attack because I said, no, I'm going to do something different. I'm moving to Singapore and uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on e-learning. Um, so I'm a professor for management in Austria now at MCI, Management Center Innsbruck, and do have an, an emphasis on e-learning, but I'm also still a professor at Global Next. And, uh, I'm focusing on organizational behavior, and this is why I'm also doing the ethical decision-making part here. Um, with a strong, 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 strong emphasis, um, I have an international business, and that goes hand in hand with HR and strategic management. Well, yeah, so that's, that's a little bit about myself here. With uh, research interests, as you can see here, um, covering a, a span of issues, from the um, pedagogical part over the uh, managerial part to also part, parts going into healthcare because of my personal background. I also wrote a book called Wealth Wisdom for Everyone a long, long time ago. Uh, I think it's 10 years now. Um, and that was also quite an interesting uh, experience because it made me, in my, you might have seen this in my intro, uh, appear in a 26 series TV um, or 26 part TV series uh, broadcast across Asia um, about ma managing money, managing um, one's finances, and that was specifically also directed um, at needs of, uh, especially for uh, in general people's needs, but also uh, specifically for migrant women. Um, in Singapore, and there I also became part of INSERT's um, uh, panel for women uh, and finance. 
All righty. Um, so a quick overview about uh, what you're going to be confronted with. Um, yeah, Bindu, I think it is a, a very, very important topic, um, especially for women, because no matter where, um, the, the decisions for the upkeep of the family, let's put it like this, um, are traditionally with women. And even though whether they earn or not um, a lot of money or no money at all, I think it's very important to educate uh, people about finance. Uh, and even if it's very, very basic stuff. And if we talk about migrant women, you can imagine, say, Filipinas uh, who send their money home every month. And at the end of the day, when they return home, they have nothing left for themselves because uh, they didn't think about it. So that was um, a very important thing. And it, it um, sort of uh, did a lot of coaching for women in this respect. So it was very, very interesting and obviously it made an impact, which which made me very happy, I must say. Um, anyway, so let's go back here to the module overview. Um, we'll be talking about problem solving, decision making, uncertainty and ethics. Um, and I'll give you a quick overview here about the content. Um, what you find in your study pack and the subject content. And then we'll have also two discussion boards uh, and the third one about reflect, uh, reflecting things. Um, uh, in the introduction to the module, you see that you will be able or should be able at the end of the module to describe uh, each of the four steps in the problem solving process and talk about problems and uh, performance problems and opportunity gaps. Um, that we want to be able to resolve the gaps between the problem state and the desired state and make decisions that actually affect organizational effectiveness with a systematic problem solving approach. And that's the important part here. Uh, we also want to identify barriers uh, when it comes to uncertainty when making decisions and uh, make ethical decisions using the decision making aids for ethics. All right. So we'll start with problem solving here in the subject content. You will see that you have this kind of, of um, diagram where you see first identify problems. Well, yes, yeah, sounds very logical, but uh, very often this is not done. People just realize that there is something, but they don't really know what it is. So it's the first and most critical step uh, because obviously it's difficult to solve a problem if you have no clue what actually the problem is. Second uh, point here, diagnose causes, is root cause analysis. What are the root causes? And there we have inductive or deductive approaches. Um, inductive approach um, where you start by analyzing the gap and then locate a root cause. How do you do that? You elaborate the underlying causes and then figure out what it actually is. Or you use a deductive approach where you start with a set of typical root causes for a gap and then eliminate those that are probably not the true cause of the gap. So you just keep on asking why, essentially, until you get to the root cause. Um, the third step is generate solutions. So what are the possible solutions? How are you going to find those solutions? And as you can see here from the very first bullet point, this is a creative process. And uh, very often when people come from technical backgrounds, um, they find this very difficult because um, out of the box thinking is not um, something that uh, some people find very easy. So I always say here, and you also have this in the, um, in the course content, do use your imagination, do use your intuition and generate as many possible solutions as possible. And by that, do brainstorm. But when you do that, be sure you, you, you reward ideas, you reward brainstorming. Um, if you have a culture that does not reward this, but uh, where people get scared of or are scared of making a mistake, you will have problems getting them to come up with uh, creative solutions. Um, Step four, develop a plan. Prachi, can you hear me? I hope it, it works. Okay, all the others can hear me? Okay, then Prachi, it, it appears to be a, a problem at your end then. 
since the others can hear me, um, maybe you check your connection. All right, because I will continue um, now. Um, so step four, develop a plan that will actually allow you to implement solutions. Um, how should these solutions be implemented? And uh, make sure that those solutions that you implement actually close the gaps that were intended to close. That sounds so logical. It is logical, but very often not followed. Because solutions may seem okay or good or adequate, uh, but in theory, um, they do not do that. And you might have barriers in the organization to prevent you from actually succeeding here. So uh, think about developing a plan that will allow you to implement solutions without causing new gaps, greater gaps, really a, a disastrous thing, obviously, then. Uh, you don't want to add to already existing problems. Um, so do accurately and completely identify the problem. But when it comes to decision making, it's the same thing. You have to accurately identify and completely identify the decision problem. Um, and there we have uh, an issue that most of all, actually all of us, uh, all of us will be exposed to, to and have been exposed to, and that is heuristics. Um, things that you don't realize that you're actually doing. And when you read through this in a such content, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that everybody in this group will find his, uh, her, her self somehow in there. Oh, yeah, actually, that's true. I've realized, I'm only realizing now, or I've realized this before. So this is a very important part for your self-reflection as well, because it's about a broad set of rules or patterns or guidelines when you make decisions that you don't really realize. They can be a good shortcut, but they can cause errors and problems. Um, one would be perceived loss versus perceived gain. You have this in your subject content. Um, the thing is that most of the decisions do have a certain element of risk, and there are only very few sure things in a business environment, especially in uh, a competitive business environment as we are exposed to these days. Now, risk averse people would prefer a certain payoff to moderate gamble, and risk seeking, uh, risk seeking people, on the other hand, would prefer an uncertain gamble to a moderate or large payoff. So that might be, might be something um, that you have seen, maybe with yourselves, maybe with other people. Second is uh, the availability bias. Um, well, people do measure the probability or the frequency. Um, of, of something on the basis um, of which instances or occurrences stand out most clearly in the person's memory. So if you remember something or if you think that relates to something that you subconsciously um, relate uh, to in a certain uh, decision, then uh, there might be a problem. You might be sort of clouded in your judgment. So the availability heuristic suggests, as you can see here, that uh, vivid events will be more easily remembered than events that are bland or vague. Um, the problem is that uh, the importance of a certain event can be falsely increased by your memory, by your thinking that this might be happening or might not be happening. So you might be overestimating an event's probability of recurring. An example for this would be a plane crash. Um, it doesn't mean only because one plane crashed that uh, this will be happening very frequently. And in fact, traveling by air is much, much safer than traveling by car, for example. Um, uh, okay, Manzuita, uh, welcome. I'm just giving an overview of where we stand in the, uh, with, the, with the subject content, okay? So representativeness uh, bias, where people do assess the frequency, probability, likely causes of an event, um, actually based on the similarity of that event to their stereotypes of similar occurrences. So please read through this as well. Um, overconfidence, very interesting bias. 
where people often have levels of confidence that are completely unwarranted. And um, this could be in their abilities, judgment or knowledge. So if you say, if you ask people, do you think you are an average driver or better than average driver? I think you have more than 80% of people usually saying in polls that they are better than average. Um, it's a bit difficult if 80% are better than average. Um, yeah, it is quite common, exactly. Um, very often it happens with uh, students when they, um, you know, high school students when they go for exams, ah, I'm, I'm well prepared and everything, and then it's a bit difficult uh, for them to gather why it didn't work out the way they expected it to work out. Another example, and you have this in your course content, would be arbitration hearings that uh, each side typically assumes that their probability of winning is higher than 50%. Uh, the same thing is with cars, with, with the ability to drive. Uh, you can't have, you know, everybody being better than average. Um, okay, uh, 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 let's go back here. Representativeness bias uh, question here, where you assess the frequency and probability or likely causes and availability bias, how vivid it is in your uh, memory, okay? So then the next thing is uh, the consequences of these errors that we are prone to, that we are exposed to on a daily basis. Um, it might be at home, it might be in business, um, just everywhere. Our decision-making um, environment is very complex, all right? So we have difficult and time pressure decisions um, in, a, in the business world. Um, we might be able to think, okay, um, uh, I have you know, a shortcut here in making this decision. And uh, the example here with the representativeness bias uh, would kick in here. For example, if people say, no, I don't want to hire a woman because you know she could have a baby and then not go back to the office as quickly as I want her. So I don't hire any women because I've had that once before. So that would be uh, an example for the representativeness bias. Um, that could be a shortcut for making a decision, but uh, this is a disastrous shortcut. Uh, it is. It only focuses in this case on stereotyping, uh, which is something we want to avoid, obviously. Um, so, as you see here from uh, the third bullet point, heuristics are troublesome if you apply them indiscriminately. And uh, does now this time that you saved actually make up for the lowered quality of decision uh, of the decision? Um, in the example that I just gave you, it certainly will not make up for this. Um, you have here the the example. Um, let me just put the, the chat window further up so that you can actually see this better. Um, that is an example from the subject content. Now, the representativeness heuristic, as it says here, is misapplied. It can lead to ethnic, gender, and other types of discrimination as managers judge whole groups by one or two individuals. The example that I just gave you now, all right? Um, example women, example ethnic groups, you know, all people are like this, da 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 da, all these things. So I, I hope um, this explains it now. Um, and we need to be very much aware about the consequences if we apply this. So it is very much a reflective exercise for you when you read through this subject content, because you will learn a lot for your life and you will learn how to make better decisions um, left, right, and center, I would say. Um, obviously, we do live in uncertain times. Um, it is a common issue that we face, um, that we face um, in everyday life, that we face also in managerial positions. Now, we need to, as a first step, think about the probability that certain events might occur. And there's something about miscalibration that comes up in the subject content. And this occurs when people are overconfident or underconfident in their probability assessments. Now, again, we, there's a reason why we talked about the biases before. Um, and when you read through the subject content, you will understand it even more. 
obviously this is only an introductory webinar with giving you an overview, um, but it hopefully already guides you into the right direction. So we look at the miscalibration that might occur and very often does occur. And after assessing the probability, you will need to communicate very, very clearly to minimize confusion and also unrealistic expectations. And that leads us to something that you will be focusing on later in this program also, and that is change management. <coughs> um, where communication is key. Um, because people are then in uncertain situations. They don't know what to expect and that can get out of control. Now, if we um, also think about uh, a further aspect, that would be the sunk cost fallacy. Now, what is this? This is something that uh, where, where people actually make a mistake of allowing irrelevant sunk costs, so costs that are, have already occurred, to play a role in the decision-making process. Um, they have already occurred, so if you want to make good decisions, uh, you have to be aware of this. Um, again, read more about it in the um, subject content. Um, next point here, when we solve complex problems, we can use decision trees. They might be very helpful. Um, some of you might, heard about, have, might have heard about fishbone diagrams, etc. cetera, um, that goes into this direction uh, to just help you making decisions. And we'll be using this also in a way for um, the part on ethics that I'll be talking about in a minute. Um, and here we already are with the ethics part. Um, talking about ethics and ethics systems, since we talk about ethical decision making, um, three different parts that are important here with uh, utilitarianism, focusing on creating the greatest balance of benefits over harms. And that generally gives equal weight to everybody who's affected. Now, a uh, second point would be rights theory that focuses on inherent moral characters of certain decisions and actions. Um, now, people, they say, have certain natural rights um, and actions such as stealing or lying, for example, are wrong in themselves and cannot be justified simply by the benefits they may create. And then we have, as a third point, justice theory that focuses on the, de on the definition of fair, what is just. Uh, so definition of fair outcomes, definition of fair procedures, and how is this defined? This is actually defined in the uh, distribution of outcomes. So distributive justice, all the procedures used to reach a decision. So that's procedural justice. Um, we do have... Uh, Arada, you will need to read through the subject content for this, okay? Because um, there's lots and lots and lots here in the uh, subject content, and we will be discussing this um, when you apply this. Uh, first of all, well, in the discussion board, and we're talking about the discussion boards in a second, okay? Um, because it is very, very important for me that you read through the content and then apply it immediately. You will be applying it to your workplace and your personal situation right away. And that gives you the biggest impact, okay? So I'll just go through this here and then talk about the discussion board so that you see uh, what I actually mean. Um, you see here on the right-hand side a, a graph where you see three uh, circles with legal, ethical, and socially responsible. We'll be talking about this um, in a minute. Um, that ethical is actually more than legal and that socially responsible behavior is more than ethical behavior, which again is more than legal behavior. Now, we do have decision-making aids for ethics and for ethical behavior. And um, I would just try to take two here, which I want to show you two. Um, you find them in your uh, subject content. The first one is Laura Nash's 12 questions and the second one is a flow chart, um, more like a similar to a decision tree thingy, um, based on, on some frameworks by Kavanaugh. All right, so let's uh, look at this now. I'll just try to make the chat window smaller here. 
the the important questions here that uh, you can ask yourself when when making decisions whether ethical or not would be first of all have you defined the problem accurately as I mentioned before it sounds very logical but it's not uh, unfortunately it's not uh, very often uh, common knowledge um, and common sense sorry common sense should uh, one one should think that it prevails but it doesn't very often and that's a problem so first of all have you defined the problem accurately second very important already, how would you define the problem if you actually were not on your side of the fence but on the other side of the fence? Number three, how did the situation occur in the first place? Number four, to whom and to what do you give your loyalty as a person and as a member of the organization? So reflect about loyalty. Uh, then number five, reflect about the intention. What is your actual intention in making this decision? And six, how does this intention compare? with the probable results. Then seven, whom could your decision or action injure? Eight, can you discuss the problem with the affected parties before you make your decision? Could you actually do that or not? And if not, why? So think about this. Uh, the nine, are you confident that your position will be as valid over a long period of time as it seems now? Obviously that alludes to long-term thinking versus short-term thinking. And uh, could you disclose without form your decision or action to your boss or your CEO, or your board of directors, or your family or society as a whole? Or would you rather not disclose it? So if you don't want to disclose it, that uh, would give you a very good indication that there is something that you would need to look into when making this decision, right? And uh, number 11, what is the symbolic potential of your action if understood or misunderstood? Also very, very important, especially um, you are in a, in a leadership, leadership program. Uh, a lot of leadership is done not through words, but non-verbally and through your actions without even saying anything. So very important, what is the symbolic potential of your action if understood or if misunderstood? Again, as I mentioned before, the communication aspect very important and comes in here. And uh, last question, under what conditions would you allow your ex uh, would you allow exceptions to your stance? Um, I think a very good set of questions that should really be helpful. Uh, if we look at the flowchart that I man mentioned, um, you have a data gathering part uh, where you gather the facts surrounding the actor policy. This is the flowchart now where you ask three ethical criteria. Does it maximize aggregate well-being? Does it respect the rights of the individuals involved? And is it consistent with, consistent with the canons of distributive and procedural justice? If you have no on all criteria uh, when you analyze and you know your judgment is the act of policy is not ethical, if it's yes on all criteria, it is ethical. If you have no on one or two criteria, you again have such a decision tree here. Are there any overriding factors or is there one criterion far more important and validly so? Are there any incapacitating factors, et cetera, et cetera? So if this is no, then it's not ethical. If it's yes, then it is ethical. So another kind of, of aid for making decisions uh, uh, ethically. As I mentioned before, here on the right hand side we have this graph of legal, ethical, socially responsible stuff. Social responsibility, as I said, is broader than ethics and that in turn is broader than uh, the legal aspect only. Ethics is concerned with negative rights, so um, right, duties of non-interference like rights of privacy or property or human dignity um, with a do no harm prescription essentially. But um, we do live in a complex society, so we do not only only have negative um, rights, but also positive duties that we need to perform. So that is um, the the difference here. And for corporate citizenship, as I said, the legal um, levels, the, sorry, the three levels of, of corporate action um, with socially respons socially responsible actions being the widest circle, and then we have ethical actions and legal actions. Something that is legal does not necessarily need to be ethical. It can still be legal, but it's not ethical. So we need to uh, bear this in mind. 
as I said, the duties of social responsibility go beyond ethical duties, and ethical duties go beyond legal duties. And as I just said, a person could not breach any law, but still act unethically. So you treat an, an employee unfairly might well be covered by law, but uh, it might be, un or it is unethical. All right, um, so that is something that I wanted to share about the subject content with you. Number two is that I will be sharing additional articles with you, okay? Um, I will not, these are just some examples. Um, you, didn't, you don't need to write down the, the links. I will post them for you. Maybe every, maybe twice a week, every other day, something like this, depending uh, that you're not swamped with uh, readings. Um, usually people find articles and, you know, who knows, maybe during the duration of other three weeks um, together, there will be some new articles that come in that um, are brand new. Um, I also will be sharing them with you should they come up. Right, as I mentioned before, discussion boards. Um, and I'm right, okay, you don't even, so one second. Um, these are, okay, let's go back here. Um, these are all articles, these are not videos, okay? So these are these are articles. It could be McKinsey articles. Um, it could be Harvard Business Review articles. Whatever. Okay. The PowerPoint uh, will be Namrata. Um, it will be uploaded not as a PowerPoint, but as the 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 webinar of today. Um, it will be uploaded in the section, and you will know about it when it's uploaded. Okay. So that um, everybody, it, it's not only the PowerPoint, but it's, uh, it's the whole webinar with the voice over everything is there. Um, exactly, so the recording, the recording uh, will be there. All righty, so discussion boards, number one, decision-making process. Um, Brujali, I just mentioned the articles, I will be posting them for you. Um, one after another, that you don't have everything at the same time, but maybe every other day, twice a week, depending, I will release it, you know, bit by bit, because people find it easier easier to digest. If I give you everything to read at once, you feel like, oh my goodness, there's an avalanche coming on to me, and it's just too much. So um, I've made the, yeah, I've, I've just realized, and I've made um, the experience that uh, it's just easier for people to, to digest like this. Okay, so you don't need to worry. You don't need to take down the links here. I will be posting them. So for your convenience, you will just be able to click on it there and uh, just read through this. And I hope you will find them useful. And as I said, if there are brand new articles added um, and I see them, that, that they do exist, then I will be adding them. Same for you. If you, ladies, if you find any articles, that you find particularly interesting, please do share them, all right? Uh, we're all here to learn from each other, and I think it's great um, if we can benefit from each other a lot. All righty, um, let's go back to the discussion board. Uh, number one, about decision-making processes. I would ask you here on the discussion board, I will ask you here, um, what are some of the decision challenges you have, come, you have come across in your career? And that will be, um, really career-driven challenges. It could be, you know, children or not, or what to do, or moving with a family, or firing someone, or whatever. I don't know what it is. Uh, you should explain this, what happened, and how do you or did you overcome those challenges? And did that affect the behavior of, of your colleagues? And how did it uh, do this? And then number three, thinking about what you have read about ethics in the subject content and about your own experiences in this area. How will this affect your future decision-making processes? And not only, by the way, about the subject content, but also from the discussion that will ensue um, with, from within the two groups, because obviously your batch is divided into two, into two groups. Um, so peer learning is very important. So maybe you say, oh, I've seen that. Um, I don't know, Ami says that uh, Bindu wrote this and this, and I will be 
I, I think about incorporating this now in my decision making processes or whatever. I'm just giving an example I'm making up here, okay? Um, also, please think about obstacles you expect you might have to overcome. Why? Why not? I always want to know why or why not. All right? It's not simply just um, putting something forward, but I would like to know why or why not, because that gives you uh, a deeper level of uh, understanding. Uh, second discussion board will be <clears throat> very much into ethical decision making um, about IKEA, uh, about child labor, where you will be asked to read the case study and uh, then tell us how the lady should respond to the invitation for IKEA to have a representative appear on an upcoming broadcast of a German TV program. Uh, what action should she take regarding the IKEA supply contract? with the company and what would be the long-term strategy that you suggest that she takes? And should the company stay or should it, uh, sorry, there's a, a typo, is that shout, it's just, <laughs> what's the autocorrect in here? Should it exit? Um, describe the impact of such a decision and how you could, uh, you would propose to manage it, all right? Uh, number three is a reflective discussion board. Now, what are the, your takeaways from these past weeks? Again, it's about reflecting. Um, what have you learned from this? How would you apply this um, in your workplace? What's the that and why? But where did you, um, okay, sorry, no reflective, then we, we put it because it was in, in the info I, um, I was sent before. Um, then you can just put this into your reflective thoughts into the decision making processes here, right? Um, I think it is very important that you do the um, reflective part very, very deeply and very, very well, um, because this is how you learn most. And uh, it's, I think, going to be very helpful for you. Um, for your career, for your lives in general. And uh, this is why I would like to draw your attention to one more thing, and that is uh, do not cut and paste from anywhere. It should be really you, and everything needs to be in your own words. And if you, um, you know, for example, if we look at the IKEA uh, case study, first of all, just go through the case study and work with this, okay? Don't look for secondary sources or anything. Just go through the case study and decide on how you um, would do things best. Um, if you want to add things from, from the internet, you can do that, but you must um, show that you have them from the internet or wherever. So you need to reference. And even if you have things from other sources and reference, they must be written in your own words. You still reference them, but you write in your own words. If you have to take uh, something word for word, so if you want to have a quote, you can do that. But uh, again, you, A, you have to reference, and B, you put it in inverted commas, all right? Yeah, exactly, Bindu. Um, um, absolutely. Uh, you need to read and you know, analyze and whatever. Um, but you need to uh, reflect for the first discussion board really for yourself. Um, and for the second one, um, and just in general anyway, um, if you want to use uh, further sources on the case study, of course you can do that. But the case study itself will be sufficient, okay? Uh, if you use other sources, then you must reference. I just had the example again that somebody cut and pasted and cut and paste it and cut and paste it. And then um, obviously I realized immediately that this is not in his own words. And I told him, and he still keeps on doing this well, and I told him that will entail a non-passing mark because that won't work. Uh, it's, it's a bit childish in a way, you know? Um, but um, because, you know, we are, we're not forced to go into school, but we want to learn, and that's the great thing here. Now, what I want you to do is be there and be present and make yourself seen. Um, I think you've heard from uh, Dr. Evelyn that a uh, uh, little bit often is better than a lot all at once, okay? So be there every day. Um, make it a habit. 
when people tell me, oh, this is, you know, I don't know if I can do that, I can only say to them, check how many times a day are you checking your Facebook feed? And then people go like, oops, oh, yes, actually, yes, oh, yeah, I, I'm, hmm, I can do it, yes, I can. And then people are really uh, relieved <laughs> because they realize they can do it. Then number five here, interact with your fellow participants because of peer learning. As I mentioned before, you will be learning a lot from each other, okay? And very important, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Um, I'm always there. You can contact me anytime via email. All right? Um, do we still have any questions here? Because uh, if we have any questions, please put them into the chat box. Um, 9.30 will not work because I am in Austria. And uh, that is 6 a.m. my time. Uh, that won't work, I'm afraid. To um, help you here, but um, I can't do 6 a.m. my time. Yeah, late evening. It depends on what is late evening for you. Okay, late evening is difficult. 8 p.m., okay. Okay, rest of the modules is 9.30. Yeah, I'm in Austria, that's the problem. With a US client, okay. Um, let me see if... Uh, Okay, we'll, we'll figure it out what we can do, but I cannot do six o'clock in the morning because at six o'clock in the morning, obviously, I'm at home and uh, my children are still asleep. So this is this is a bit of an issue here. Um, yeah, all righty. So questions that you have. Um. The uh, thought you're asking about the PDF, they should be all available in there. Can you, uh, Swati, can you maybe please send this to student care? Uh, Philip, maybe you can uh, look into this, that um, the that the PDFs apparently do not show everywhere. Okay. Any other questions? Hang on a second. Just make it bigger again. So, um, when we generate the solutions, as you, Nagaratna, uh, as you asked here, uh, then we need to think about um, which solutions are actually implementable. Um, because we don't want to implement the, the big drama, right? Um, so we need to think about it this way, okay? If we only do it in the implementation phase, then that will be too late because then many, many people will be affected, okay? Um, yes, student care will be sending you the invite earlier. Um, I only got it uh, yesterday as well, okay? All right, I mean, when you have questions, um, Ask me, otherwise we'll talk about it in the webinars. Um, I'm just checking all the uh, chat questions that came in. Okay. Cost versus benefit, uh, I wouldn't say that, Pratana. Cost versus benefit analysis takes precedent over an ethical decision. I would certainly not say that. Uh, you, you have to think about this uh, in, in, uh, in the setting you're in. Um, I would not. Uh, do um, a cost beneficial decision that is unethical, personally. Okay. Um, Namrata, good question. Does the ethical thinking between, differ between men and women? There is a study about this. Okay. I will be sending you the article, guys, if you want to, uh, because I think um, it is interesting. There was a paper, uh, I think it came from Berkeley, one or two papers about this. Uh, I'll be sharing this with you, okay? If the ethical decision is more costly for the organization, well, yes, it depends on the cultural setting you're in. 
if you want to be in a dilemma such as Shell or Exxon, for example, with their unethical way towards the environment and then having big, big, big time drama for the organization because of unethical behavior and losing billions of dollars, uh, I would certainly uh, not say that uh, um, that this needs to or should be ignored, right? Okay. Uh, okay, next question. I'm just going through all the questions. Uh, exactly. Uh, Kalpalapta, uh, ethical decision making varies from culture to culture and organization to organization. It's very much an organizational culture thing. And uh, yes, ethical decisions will be driven by your personal values, by your upbringing, where you're from, what you've seen, how you grew up, what you were taught as a child. Um, that also differs a lot. Um, values, very, very important. Uh, deep root, okay, yes, they hold deep root within you and they will influence your decisions, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, good point, uh, Bhuvanes um, Vari, uh, that unethical decisions could be more costly for companies than ethical ones, and one can feel ethical and others not. Who will decide it exactly? That is a leadership issue. That's why you're in a leadership program. All right, so it is about shaping your views and and showing it, um, that there might be more to it than appears at first, right? Um, exactly, Swati. Very good point. Team in Germany and India with uh, uh, something can be ethical in one place but unethical in the other place. Uh, let's just take the example of uh, labor law. Um, can be ethical in one place, can be unethical in another place. When doing business internationally, it could be a uh, disaster. Um, how does it vary from culture to culture? Kinjal, you ask this. Well, it depends on the setting you're in. It depends on how women are treated, whether there are equal opportunities. Uh, it may depend on, uh, for example, how much, uh, well, yeah, again, labor laws as an example. If you have two weeks of annual leave or not, or how, let's take an example of uh, um, how maids are treated in, in certain Asian countries uh, would land employers in prison in Europe, for example, all right? So um, that could be, you know, we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. Um, when you ask, so I mean, you ask, when you interact with different cultures, this difference would lead to a conflict in the ethical decision maker. Yes, absolutely. Um, how would this be tackled? You need to, Really, obviously, we can't do that in one webinar because it goes very, very deep uh, down there and we would need to talk a lot about it. But the general rule is you will need to see where you are and you will need to be very, very much aware of the potential differences in the um, cultures that you interact with or that you act in. And once you're aware of it, you will realize things work or do not work in certain cultures. So it's a lot about awareness, okay? Um, let's see. In what way does compromise come into play and what its impact? Well, Sanabar, it depends, again, on the situation. Um, compromise can work out well, but it might not work out well because it might not be a compromise big enough. Again, that is completely situation-driven, okay? Um, Exactly, with the with the many countries uh, and many companies, Kalbata, um, what you mentioned here, the it is a very very broad space. You need to take in a, into account people within one culture. Now, India obviously has got many many different cultures, and it's just not there is not just one Indian culture. Um, that is already one thing. I mean, the best thing. <laughs> I always like the example that one Indian student gave me uh, when he talked about um, cross-cultural differences. And he said when he came from Kerala to Bangalore, he had a shock, he said, because he saw women smoke. And he had a real shock. And uh, then he said, but you know, ma'am, when I moved to London, my shock was even bigger because I saw a lady bus driver. So um, you see very small um, things can make, can have a big impact. So it's, it's really <laughs> interesting where things start from. And when you have people 
from different countries, from different companies with different corporate cultures, different personal approaches to things, it's going to be even more difficult. Extra working hours, Bindu, you mentioned. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, Philip, you mentioned, okay, link states, that's also fine. Uh, does emotion affect you in taking ethical decisions? Absolutely, and an important part, Mahima, that you mentioned. Please do look at the heuristics, the decision-making errors. Um, that will help you here as well, okay? Okay. Um, so I hope I'm going to go. So I hope I'm through all the, the, the questions now. Yes, because uh, Jabata, emotions and culture always affect in decisions, yes. Um, it's a real rules put down by the organization which decide what is ethical for the organization. It's not only the organization, but it's the leader. It's the leadership function in a, in a, in a team. It doesn't need to be um, um, the whole organization. You can start small, you know, because very often people hide behind the organization. Oh, the organization doesn't allow this or that, but you can still, still uh, start small. Um, from Dubai, oh, Anjali, really? With an all-female crew, including a captain? That's good, that's girl power, yes, Mahima, women power. <laughs> um, so, Vrushali, you asked, do you need to present your decision using the techniques given the data material? Um, it will be um, easier for you if you reflect it, if you, if you play back and forth with the study material, I would say. You don't have to write this down, you know, according to this and this and this. But from experience, it helps people when they use it with the study material. All right? So any other questions? I was a bit behind with my answering the questions because there were so many um, questions that came in. It's great that we have such an interactive webinar. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, kind words, Srivitya. Very nice. All righty. Um, if, thank you very much. I will try to get well soon. <laughs> um, the uh, next webinar, so we will be seeing each other, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. If you have any questions, please do feel free to email me, all right? Okay, then have a great day.